A cheerful morning to everyone. I, Rishika Multani, feel glad to welcome you all here in the session of second Orient City Literature Fest by SGR Knowledge Foundation. The session will be of 40 minutes, and we have an exciting poetry writing workshop with our guest speaker, Anita Murthy Ma'am. Anita Ma'am is a software consultant by profession and works full time in an exciting technology space. She is a voracious reader and loves books. So it is not a surprise that she is also a partner come librarian at OZ Nook Library, a library exclusively for children. She has been published both in print and online. She has written STEM based picture books like The Drawing Game and Where is Nandini with Pratham books. She has also published two books for older children Great Folk Tales of the World and The Teenage Diary of Razia Sultan. And she is currently working on a number of projects. She also writes poetry and has won prizes for them. The most recent being a contest conducted by Arts Illustrated Magazine. Handing over the session to you, ma'am. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Anita, and thank you so much, Rishika, for that wonderful, cheery introduction. Uh, I hope all of you are having a very good Sunday, very cheerful Sunday, and I hope to have more fun with you guys uh, at this poetry workshop, where we'll um, probably, you know, learn a little bit about what to look for in a poem and how to make a poem more interesting. And you will also get to write your own little uh, poetry. So I do hope you have a great time. And please feel free to uh, put your comments, your questions on chat so that we can uh, take this workshop forward in a very interactive way. So thank you so much, uh, Rishika. Uh, now I will just share my screen. OK, so today we're going to uh, talk about poetry. And uh, what I'd really like to know from you guys is what do you think poetry is all about? What do you, when somebody says poetry to you? What goes on in your mind? What do you feel? Oh, I'm not sure if I'm seeing any messages on chat. Um, Ma'am, actually, we are live online, so it will be shown in YouTube. OK, so um, OK, so uh, I'll just go ahead then. Uh, so what we uh, think about when, you know, when I've done this, uh, when I've asked this question to other children, most of them talk about emotions, imagination, and so on. Um, and it's all true, because poetry is really a very powerful medium. And it gives you a lot of freedom. If you look at it, um, poetry gives you freedom to express what you want in the way you want. And uh, there is really no restriction. So it's very, very freeing when you write poetry. So I'm going to look at a couple of technical aspects uh, which will help us appreciate poetry better. And so what I'll do is I'll just um, take this very, very popular verse, which everybody must have come across sometime in their life, called roses are red, violets are blue, sugar is sweet, and so are you. Now, actually, I've seen variations of this verse, which are really hilarious. But this is the, uh, you know, the base version. And what I'd like you to look at is a couple of things in this verse. Uh, first of all, poetry is a lot about rhythm. Uh, people love to 
Or oh, rhythm is something which is really basic in life. You know, it's as basic as your heartbeat. Your heartbeat goes to a rhythm. And everything, uh, you know, when it has a rhythm, a beat, we respond so much better to it. And poetry is like that, that you have a, a beat to it, a rhythm to it. And one of the things which help give you this kind of beat or this kind of rhythm are the number of syllables. Now, syllables, if you know, they are just a grouping of letters where you pronounce it all at one shot. So if you look at this poem or this verse, you see that every line has four syllables. So you have roses are red. So roses has has uh, two syllables and uh, R and red have one syllable each because they're all pronounced at the same time. So if you look at this verse, you see that every line has four syllables. And that is one way of, uh, not the only way of course, but this is one way of making rhythm and rhyme happen, okay? So when you have the name, same number of syllables, a certain rhythm comes up. So then we also look at something called the rhyme scheme, uh, where you have a letter assigned to every line and rhyming lines are associated with the same letter. So if you look at this, for example, you have roses are red, violets are blue, sugar is sweet and so are you. So the violets are blue and so are you rhyme. So they have the same letter assigned to them. So they have, so in this case, the rhyme scheme is A, B, C, B. So if you look at a lot of poems, you can figure out what are the number of syllables and what is the rhyme scheme. And this gives you a sense of how the poem has been constructed so that you get that sense of rhythm in it. So these are some minor things. Of course, a lot of poems do not have rhymes. They do not follow any uh, rhyme scheme. They don't have the same set of syllables. But what we are looking at today is something related to these aspects of how you create rhythm using syllables, the number of syllables and the rhyme scheme. So uh, I would like to show you a few poems which uh, kind of bring home this message to you. So I will be looking at poems by Shel Silverstein, uh, which are very famous and uh, he's, he's a great poem, a poet to um, you know read. Uh, he's a lot of fun. So make sure you look out for poems by him. So the first poem goes like this. How not to have to dry the dishes? If you have to dry the dishes, such an awful boring chore. If you have to dry the dishes instead of going to the store. If you have to dry the dishes and you drop one on the floor, maybe they won't let you dry the dishes anymore. So this is a really funny poem. It's about a very simple thing, right? I mean, who would think about writing a poem on doing the dishes or drying the dishes? So this is a really good example of how you take a very, very boring, daily, mundane task and you make, you create fun out of it. You create poetry out of it. And, uh, you know, my first poem uh, called The Beetroots, which was published, my first uh, published poem was when I had to, you know, my mom called me to the kitchen and said, hey, come on, now you have to do some work for me, great some beetroots for me. And as I was greeting them, I was looking at the beautiful colors, the shapes, and that is how I wrote my first poem. And, uh, you know, it got published. So what I would really like to say is that poetry can come from anywhere and anything, you know. So you can take up the most boring thing. OK, you, you know, you your homework or you know, um, your chores or doing the laundry, whatever, and you can make a poem out of it. Poetry is such fun. So if you look at this, 
you see that every alternate line, that is the first, third, and fifth line are rhyming. So if you look at the rhyme scheme, you will have A, A, A for the first, third, and uh, fifth line. And the second, fourth, sixth, and eighth line, they rhyme. So you, uh, the only line which doesn't rhyme is the second last one. So your rhyme scheme is like A, B, A, B, A, B, C, B. Okay, that is your rhyme scheme. So if you look at it. The other interesting thing to look at is if you look at the syllable count. If you look at the lines, the second line and the fourth line, which are such an awful, boring chore, okay, that comprises of seven syllables. Such, an, or, full, bo, ring, chore. So there are seven syllables. And if you look at the rhyming line, which is the fourth line, it says, stead of going to the store. Now, stead of going to the store has seven syllables. And if he had used instead of going to the store, it would have become eight syllables. So then the rhythm gets a little off. So this is a lovely example of how you, what the choice of words, your choice of words, how you choose your words so that you make up a proper rhythm. So if you have seven, uh, such an awful boring chore, instead of going to the store, your rhythm goes a little off. So this is one of the ways of actually creating your rhythm and rhyme. Then I will show you another poem, which is quite different and which I really like. It is called The Zebra Question. I asked the zebra, are you black with white stripes or white with black stripes? And the zebra asked me, are you good with bad habits or are you bad with good habits? Are you noisy with quiet times? Are, are you quiet with noisy times? Are you happy with some sad days or are you sad with some happy days? Are you neat with some sloppy ways or are you sloppy with some neat ways? And on and on and on and on and on and on he went. I'll never ask a zebra about stripes again. So this is a really cute poem, which I, uh, you know, I adore. And uh, over here, if you look at it, there's not, there's, you know, there's no syllable count as such. There's no effort to maintain the syllable count. There is uh, some amount of rhyme, like you have the first and second, I mean, the second and third, and then the uh, fifth and sixth and so on. So you have some kind of rhymes, but the rhymes are really uh, constructed because you have the same words repeated, isn't it? So you have like black with white stripes or white with black stripes. So you have the same words repeated, changed a bit, and that is what gives you your rhyme really. And the other thing about this poem is that it makes you think. It's such a simple question. Are you black with white stripes or white with black stripes? And the whole poem then makes you question everything and makes you think about perspective. So when you are faced with any problem, when you are faced with any question, you can look at it from various points of view. So it gives you double perspective, right? And so you can look at something and actually learn from this poem to look at something from different angles, to think about you know, different kinds of problems, but from different points of view. So this is a poem which looks very funny when you start off reading it. But when, as and when you look back at it and look more, you realize that it's actually quite a deep, quite a profound poet, poem, which is again, something made out of complete fun. When you read it the first time, you just laugh because it's so hilarious. And then it kind of sinks in and then you begin to think. So that is one more great thing about poetry 
that it make it can make you think about big things in a very simple way okay and now the last poem which i really like and which appears to be a uh, you know quite popular is this you know this is really funny and interesting you have this little man standing at the beginning so i'm going to start with that it says here i go down circle road strong and hopeful hearted through the dust and wind up just exactly where i started okay so this is a uh, i don't know it's it's a really on one level it's so funny on one level it's so deep uh you can read it any way you want and the best thing about it is it talks about a circle talks about going round and round and the entire poem is written in the form of a circle so this is really creativity at its best it's such a, a wonderful thing to see something like this and then begin wondering uh, lots of children when i have spoken to them about this poem they have said about lot of things you know they have said that it is about um uh, you know going around in circles it is uh, not knowing where you're going it is uh, you can start at any point in the circle and go back to where it was and so on so everybody takes away their own interpretation of this but this is an example of a really simple poem which is written beautifully presented beautifully and i have seen a lot of poems which are written in like for example i remember reading a poem about a bell which was written in the form of a bell so the words when they were put together they formed the shape of a bell so those are also different ways of presenting so this is just to show you the you know absolute freedom i mean for me poetry goes with freedom to be able to express whatever you want in whatever shape you want form you want and using these tools of you know rhythm of rhyme to make your point and what i really love about this is that if you take an example of a a, a book like the alchemist which is basically about the same thing you know i'm sure everybody has heard of alchemist if not read it and it's pretty much this uh, concept you know in uh, about 200 pages or 300 pages and the same thing of you know going everywhere and then coming back to where you actually started is done within just 20 lines i mean 20 words in this poem so it is it just goes to show you the power of poetry how simple words can actually be changed uh, you know make such an impact on people so now uh, now that we've looked at different kinds of poems and we've kind of you know um, had an idea of what it is to be done uh, we will look at something called a haiku okay i'm sure quite a few of you know about this those who don't know it is a very simple form of poetry and it uh, originated in japan it was actually part of longer poetry and then the first verse got broken off and now it's popularized as haiku and um, there are lots of types of haiku but i'm just going with the extremely basic uh, most uh, kind of understood or commonly understood form okay so here if you look at what does a haiku comprise of it has a 5 7 5 pattern now why i'm uh, you know discussing this 5 7 5 pattern is because it is related to the syllables we had earlier so 5 7 5 the haiku is just three lines the first line has five syllables the second line has seven syllables and the third line has five syllables again so this is the most commonly uh, adopted form of haiku and normally haiku is about season or nature now it's right now i mean there is no restriction you want to write a haiku about uh, you know school or football 
you're welcome to it. But typically, a haiku is written about season or nature. And what is interesting about a haiku is it describes something, okay, and the last sentence is like a an opposing feeling. Okay, so if you're describing something very peaceful, the last line would be something which describes conflict or you know chaos or something like that. So this is something which you normally see in uh, haikus which are traditionally written. And as I said, right now haiku, I mean, I've even come across one word haikus, which is uh, really amazing. So you're free to look that up and check it out. But this is what is commonly used. You have a 575 pattern. So it's three lines, five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables. And you remember what a syllable was, right? Like roses have two syllables, but sweet has one syllable. So you have five syllables in the first line, seven in the second line, five in the third line. It's normally about season or nature, and it has something called a cutting word, which I'll show you examples of. Now, these are examples of um, haikus, which were written by the Japanese masters. Now, actually, the syllable is not a direct uh, comparison, because in Japanese, they have sounds, and they, want, they follow the 575 pattern for the sounds. Whereas in English, we follow syllables. So what you see here, if you try to read or try to count the number of syllables, it may not match the 575 pattern. But these are translations of the Japanese haikus. So that is why it doesn't match. But when you write your own, you can write with a 575 pattern. So if we look at the first one, it says an old pond, a frog jumps in. So the first two lines, you know, draw a picture for you of something very peaceful, an old pond. What do you think of? You think of maybe still waters, mossy banks, you know, maybe a water lily or a lotus or two, quiet, peaceful, maybe nestling in a forest. So that is what you think of. And then you have the sound of water. So when the frog jumps in, obviously there's going to be a splash. And that splash is the contrasting, what we call the cutting word, what you saw here, the cutting word, right? So the sound of water is what gives the contrast effect. So you have a splash which kind of shatters the silence, which changes, you know, which causes ripples on the surface of the pond. And so there is a change. So that is the kind of effect a haiku will have, OK? If you look at the second one, you, it says, a world of dew drop, I mean, a world of dew, and within every dew drop, a world of struggle. So if you think of a world of dew, what do you think of in the mornings? I mean, you're thinking of an early morning, misty, you know, quiet, maybe birds chirping, dew on the uh, blades of grass, you know, looking so beautiful. And then he suddenly shows you what is happening inside the dewdrop. And if you look at inside the dewdrop, there are a lot of things happening. If you actually take a, you know, a microscope and look at what is happening in the dewdrop, there are lots and lots of organisms, there are lots of or things happening where they are actually struggling to uh, survive, okay? Life is there in that dewdrop. So this is the sudden contrast where you have a world of dew, you're looking at something so peaceful, so beautiful, and the dew is looking like, you know, little diamonds or whatever. And then suddenly from that macro image, he brings you down to the micro image of what happens within the dewdrop. 
And that is something which suddenly contrasts, which changes your perspective completely. So that is what the meaning of that cutting word is. Now in uh, Japanese, they will have an actual word. In English, we use the hyphen, which you see at the end of the second line. We use the hyphen to indicate that the contrast is coming up. Okay, so if you would like to write a haiku, and I'm sure uh, it, the thing is, haikus are something, you know, if you say, okay, write a poem, people get a bit intimidated. They're like, oh God, I have to rhyme, I have to, you know, make make it long, I have to, you know, uh, there's, there's a lot of pressure associated with writing a poem. If Especially if you feel uh, everyone is creative, but if you feel you are not creative, then you get very anxious that, you know, oh God, I have to think of rhyming words, I have to think of all these things, and now that you've learned about rhyme schemes and syllables, oh God, do I have to do that also? Okay, so it's not that difficult. So haiku is a very simple, easy, and pleasant way of writing your own poetry. Okay, so first of all, you can think of a season. So you can think of a season, um, let's say you think of summer, or you think of winter, or uh, the rainy season, you know. So you think of that first. Then you think of an image, okay. Now when I've done this with uh, other, uh, some of the children have thought of uh, summer, and then they've thought of ice cream. Okay, because it's something which is really um, associated with summer. Maybe you could think of a pool where you go swimming, or maybe you think of, uh, you know, uh, trekking in the mountains when it's uh, summer in the plains, whatever. So you think of some image. And then you think of an emotion. Okay. What do you feel? Do you feel happy? Do you, maybe you feel sweaty, maybe you feel tired, maybe you feel listless, exhausted, or maybe you feel really free. You feel, uh, you know, delighted that you get to hang out with friends. You feel lazy, leisurely, whatever. Okay, so you think of the emotion that you associate with, with that image and that season. And then you think of something contrasting. So let's say you thought of summer and you thought of an ice cream and you thought of joy. And what is the opposite of joy? Sorrow. And why would you feel sad suddenly? Maybe your ice cream fell down. You know, it's as simple as that. You don't have to have some profound stuff going on. Maybe just that, you know, you your ice cream cone, you know, Somebody dashed against it and slipped down and it fell on the ground and you're feeling very sad now that your ice cream is gone. So think of something contrasting. And then you put it together in a 575 pattern. So it's as simple as this. I mean, it's, it's a literal uh, cheat sheet kind of thing. So you can think of a season, you think of any image, you think of some emotion, and then you think of something contrasting for that last line, which it's almost like a joke, you know, where you have the punch line. If you look, if you look at it, it's quite similar because the joke makes you think about some things in a particular way, and suddenly the punch line changes everything, isn't it? And that's why you laugh. And a haiku is just like that, where you are bringing the reader along with some emotion giving them some images, and then bang, you turn it on them, you give in a contrasting emotion. And if you put it in a 575 pattern, three lines, five syllables, first line, seven syllables, second line, third line is seven, five syllables again, you get a haiku. So here is something I wrote. Yeah. So this I thought of the rainy season where you know how it's so windy and everything is flying around, everything is, you know, it's it seems so busy and playful. And uh, so my first line is leaves dancing in breeze. 
So you have this very joyful image of the leaves, you know, having a blast. They're all dancing because of the wind and the playful wind rushing by trees. So you have a wind which is in a very naughty mood. It wants to whip off people's, you know, hats and the clothes of the clothes line and basically having a lot of fun. So you have the leaves dancing because of this playful wind. And then the contrasting line is something which causes discomfort, which is the sharp arrows of rain. So when the rain falls, sometimes it really stings you if it's like really heavy and really sharp. So this is the example of a contrast. So you have the arrows which feel very sharp and hurtful, contrasting with the playful nature earlier. Okay. So this is an example and I would love for you all to write um, your own haiku. And there are lots of uh, examples on the net. There are, and basically what I would like to say again and again is that poetry is very, very freeing. You know, you have people who write all in capitals. You have people, for example, E.E. E. Cummings, who never use capitals. That was his way of expressing. And nobody, like, you know, or pins you down and says, no, you have to put a full stop here, you have to put a comma here, and you know, your grammar should be correct, and so on. And if you look at poetry all around you, whether it is in the form of, you know, um, rap or hip hop or anything, you know, really, if you look at uh, old, uh, let's say, Tulsi Das, uh, you know, uh, do, whatever, the Dohas, and all that, Everything has some rhythm, some rhyme, and it has a beauty to it in what they are expressing. Now, there are so many ways you can expand your poetry. You can use metaphors, you can use similes, you can use alliteration. Now, those are all, you know, technical things uh, which help you. It's, uh, but at the end of it, it is the emotion primarily, your, what you would like to convey and what you are thinking of, what your thoughts are. And the other interesting thing is that when you write a poem, um, the person who is reading it, and that is something which is very true of any writing, that when somebody is reading what you have written, they interpret it in their own way. They have their own lens, they have their own way of reading it, and your poetry can make somebody think in a very different way, enrich their uh, uh, lives, as it were. So I think uh, I'm almost out of time. So um, what I would uh, like to do is um, I would like to thank you all for this wonderful session that I'm having. I have the privilege of presenting something which is very close to my heart which I really love and which I think everybody, you know, you don't need to be a creative genius to write your own poetry. You can write it just for yourself. So I would love if for everyone to try and write something. Um, and so I would like to present this little haiku to thank you uh, for your time. Such fun a haiku can be writing from your heart. Okay, uh, so I would really like to thank uh, the Orange uh, Lit Fest for giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure and I've had a lovely time. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for this amazing session on poetry. On behalf of Orange City Literature Fest and SDR Knowledge Foundation, we sincerely express our gratitude towards your acceptance for the session and the knowledge shared with us. 
I would also like to acknowledge our radio partner, ninety-two point seven Big FM, and the publishers, Speaking Tiger, for their support. Lastly, I would like to thank our audience for joining this wonderful session. Our next session is Unleashing the Vajra: Nepal's Journey Between India and China at One PM. Thank you. Thank you. Twenty years of existence. Two universities, twenty-three educational institutes, offering a hundred and thirty-seven courses, rising in the group of institutions, a vision beyond.